Hi, everyone, and welcome to ISOJ Online. I'm Mallory Tenori, Associate Director of the Knight Center for Journalism in the Americas. Before we get started, I do want to just give you a few reminders. One is that we are interpreting this panel into Spanish. And so to access the interpretation, just click the interpretation globe in the meeting options down below and select the Spanish language channel. I should also note that we are live streaming this panel onto YouTube in English and Spanish, and the links to those YouTube channels will be in the chat feature of Zoom. So if at any point you have any technical issues with Zoom, just tune into the YouTube channel. Now, I would like to introduce our next panel titled Journalism in a Pandemic, Covering COVID-19 Now and in the Future. I should mention that in May, the Knight Center held four massive open online courses in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and French that shared the same title as this panel. The courses collectively attracted about 9,000 students from 162 countries. And so it was clear to us from these courses that journalists were really creating reporting resources and a peer-to-peer -peer learning community to deepen their understanding of COVID-19 and how to best cover it. So with that in mind, we're delighted to be continuing the conversation and expanding the learning community with today's panel. Now I'd like to turn it over to Deborah Blum, Director of the Knight Science Journalism Program at MIT, who will be moderating today's conversation. Hi, it's such a pleasure to be here with this amazing- So today's panel is about covering uh, a pandemic from the unique perspective of being right in the pandemic. And with me, I have three uh, uh, really outstanding infectious disease reporters from around the world. My name is Deborah Blum. I'm director of the Night Science Journalism Program at MIT. Uh, which is squarely in the COVID-19 infected United States of America. Uh, I have with me Vidya Krishnan, who is a journalist uh, from India, Alvaro Pereira Jr. from Brazil, and Kai Kuverschmidt from Germany. Uh, their bios are online, so I won't go into them in depth, but welcome. We're excited to have you here. I want to mention briefly a couple of statistics from now about COVID-19 that I pulled off the IBM tracker. So as of today, Tuesday, the uh, 14th of July, global cases of COVID-19 are over 13 million. The three countries that right now are reporting the highest number of new cases are the United States, at 58,000 new cases, Brazil at uh, 20,000 new cases, and uh, India, I should have had that in a different order, at 38,000 new cases, and Germany at zero. So to give you a scale of where we see the infection at this moment, I should mention that the US, Brazil, and India are the top three countries in reported new co reporting new COVID-19 infections at the moment. And uh, the, the fourth is considerably below any of them, and that's Russia at about six and a half mil, uh, thousand new cases. So clearly we are not in a case where the pandemic is under control. And we are in a case where reporters who cover the pandemic are really on the front lines of trying to figure out a fast moving virus and, a, and the fast moving state of, of science itself. And I'd like to start this discussion by going to you, Kai, on a question that we talked about earlier, which is the issue of alarmism. And that is, uh, as journalists and as science journalists, we're really trained not to overstate the case or breathlessly announce anything. Um, at least we hope we don't. And yet in this case, did we understate by virtue of our training and should we have somehow rung more alarm bells? I don't know the answer to that, but I'd be interested to hear what you think. Thanks, Deborah. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have an answer either. It's something that I really struggle with. Um, I've, I've thought a lot about it in the last, you know, months um, as, as this has, you know, gotten worse and worse. And, and of course, you know, people like Helen and me, you know, also wrote about it very early on. And the question is, should we have written about it in a different way? 
And I, I think I'm still kind of, um, you know, it's hard to kind of figure that out when you're still in the middle of it. There are two issues, I think, um, that I keep coming back to or that stand out to me. And, and one of them I, I call kind of facts, not fear. I don't know if you remember, but facts, not fear was one of the, the early slogans by the WHO. And, and I think it really encapsulates something that's very close kind of also to how science journalists work, right? It's um, this idea that we all have, you know, we react emotionally to things and, um, and we kind of uh, you know, are trained to more or less kind of take that out of the equation as, as much as we can. Um, but I think we have to realize that it's, you know, fundamentally a flawed dichotomy. I mean, there are facts that should scare you. There are facts that should make you afraid. And, and I think maybe, maybe that training that we have as science journalists in this particular situation kind of worked against us there. And I think there's, a, there's kind of the, the individual case, right? We've all had this training and we think about things in a certain way. And then there's kind of the systemic thing. Like, I, I don't even know how to put this into an article. Like, at least at Science, where I work, you know, we, we write articles in a certain way. And I'm not sure... Um, you know how to how to ring an alarm bell in a sense if if I felt comfortable doing that, and and that's one reason that I've kind of I, I've realized that I'm very different on Twitter. Like on, on Twitter, I have a certain freedom to say, you know, listen, this really worries me, and we should all take this seriously. It's kind of hard to just go out and just say it in this very you know conversational way um, in an article. So so that's something that I keep coming back to um, in in how I kind of. You know, I think there's something there that at least in the future, I, I'd like to try and get some of that into how I write articles. But I think that's kind of a, um, you know, a, a tough thing to do, at least, at least for me. And then the other thing I keep going back to is just this idea, let's call it now versus then. I mean, we're really, when we're talking about a pandemic, we're always talking about the future, right? We're ringing the alarm bell about what could happen in a way. And it's, so on the individual level, of course, there's this problem that you might be wrong. I mean, one of my editors, I won't name names, but one of my editors likes saying, you know, there are some science journalists who correctly predicted five of the last two pandemics. And, and I think that's true. I mean, there are people who, you know, who, who tend towards this kind of alarmism. And, and most of the time, we, we try to stay away from that. And then at the same time, if you're, you know, one thing that really stuck with me as well was uh, Helen did a, a panel in, uh, I think it was the Asp Asp Aspen Institute, I think. Uh, and I think, you know, Nancy Messonnier, you know, and then she really put this question to, to Fauci and others. And she said, you know, you're saying this isn't really dangerous right now, but, you know, this looks, this is not going to be contained in China. This looks like it's going to be a big problem. And I think it was Nancy, Nancy Messonnier, Messonnier who answered something like, you know, the thing about the US these days is there's only so much you can worry about. And I think something very true in that it's is it's that you know I, I like to think that if I write a really good reasoned article it might get people to pay attention but you know there is this question do you want to be a fire alarm you know that every now and then rings even though there's no fire or do you want to miss when there's actually a fire if you think about the question that way it seems very obvious but of course systemically especially in the US it feels like all of the fire alarms are ringing all the time so I kind of think like, what if everybody has tinnitus at this point and my reasoned little voice won't even, you know, they can't even hear it. Um, so, so these are kind of, I think for me, these two kind of questions that I'm, that I'm still grappling with. And, and I think it's very hard to know. I mean, on some level, what gives me some comfort is the idea. I mean, this is going to sound a little bit ironic, but, you know, it does give me comfort that even when you know it was abundantly clear that there was a huge problem a lot of countries still didn't react the right way so in some ways you know no matter how loud we would have rung the alarm bells you know it, it doesn't seem like, like like people were going to do the right thing anyway so maybe it doesn't make much of a difference but i sure as hell would like us to do better next time yeah, I mean, you've raised a couple of really interesting questions, and I want to come back to one. And I actually want to push you on that point about facts, not fear, again, in a kind of fast-moving science situation. But, uh, Vijo, do you think that if there had been major journalistic alarm bells rung in India, it would have made a difference? And, and, and I'm asking that in, a, in part because it seems to me that 
you're listening uh, or trying to get the story out. I've had a, a hard time in India, and there certainly have been reprisals and attacks against them. So if you could address that question, that would be great. I, I don't think the issue with the Indian pandemic response is uh, lack of information at this point. Uh, in fact, uh, straight off the bat, India reported its first case on the 30th of January. A day before that, uh, we have a Ministry of Traditional Medicine. And a day before India reported its first case, our uh, ministry put out information with a three-day prescription to prevent uh, coronavirus cases. So straight off the bat, the issue that was going to be with the Indian government was... Um, uh, was basically about uh, anti-science decisions uh, that they are taking. And um, I get a lot of criticism for uh, for being anti-national, which is the word in India if you question the government. And as Kai said, I spend a lot of time thinking about am I being alarmist? And many times I arrive at the conclusion that uh, if my raising an alarm, my alarm bell, in my country, where a lot of people trust the government, they are not entitlement literate and they trust the government to give out correct information so communities can protect themselves. Uh, we saw this with the polio campaign. We've seen this with uh, massive campaigns that have been run in India where uh, people who are not educated trust the government to do the right thing. And the government kind of does the right thing uh, or in the general vicinity of the right thing. We now have a right-wing government which uh, the first thing they did when they came to power back in 2014 was set up this very Ministry of Traditional Medicine. And over the last six years, uh, traditional medicine like homeopathy and Ayurveda has been uh, mixed up with religiosity. And then came this pandemic. And if you question anything at this point, uh, they accuse you of being a traitor, um, I was reading a column uh, yesterday morning in which I was shocked to find out that in, since March, 22 police cases have been registered against 55 journalists in India simply for reporting the pandemic. Uh, I routinely get uh, death threats and rape threats and uh, social media uh, trolling is something uh, that is now part of uh, um, our lives. and. I, I frankly, to circle back to this point of alarmism, I feel that uh, in, in the developing country, as someone who has the privilege of uh, being educated, uh, I feel it, there is some level of responsibility to call out, out and out uh, harmful decisions that are being taken by politicians which scientists are not even at the table at this point uh, deciding India's pandemic response. And you see uh, the result of it, India is uh, at this point has a hockey stick curve, which is showing no signs of uh, flattening. And I'm very concerned, but I'm also I feel like uh, six months in, it feels like we are in the in the thick of, it's the fog of war. And it doesn't really make sense and it's difficult to say anything with certainty. But what I do know with certainty is that uh, this is not an issue where the government doesn't know any better. This government uh, uh, has prioritized this response and they are doing it despite the information they have access to. So, yeah, that's a good answer. And, and it is a really, you know, can journalists save the world? Uh, you know, not in every circumstance, obviously. Alvaro, uh, can you talk about this in Brazil? Because certainly Bolsonaro has gotten a lot of attention for his non-science based response to the pandemic. And I think it's also been very hard for journalists in Brazil to uh, you know, accurately convey what's going in in a way that might change behavior. And, and there's a, an interesting question, I think, to some extent is even raised by Kai's point, which is that should we be the drivers of the changes of behavior, right? It, it really should not be on journalists to tell people, you know, to set policy. And yet sometimes I feel in some of these situations we're almost in that position. I wondered if you would address that in Brazil. 
Well, Deborah, I think it's uh, it shouldn't be the role of journalists to change people's behavior. But the way things went in Brazil, uh, maybe there is no one else to do the job. Um, just switching the, the the phrase, it's a clean job, but someone's got to do it. <laughs> and, 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 and journalists had to step in, and especially Globo, the network that I work for, which is the major uh, broadcaster in South America, and, and which is very dominant in terms of, of viewership to this day, even with social media and all of that. But everybody watches Globo. And, and I'm talk, not talking about specifically, specifically about the show that I work for, with, which is a Sunday evening news magazine, much in the way of 60 Minutes. But I'm talking about the, the, the daily night newscast, uh, our, our primetime newscast. I mean, in my view, and I've read that written in, in newspapers, it came to a point, especially in the first weeks of the pandemic, where the anchors of our primetime newscast sort of took the role of leadership, as strange as it might sound, that we should normally expect from the government, from the president. And the president, you know, a week into the pandemic, he goes on TV and says, well, this is just a little flu. It's not going to kill more than 800. I think 800 was the number that he uh, that he mentioned. Everybody will die someday. What can we do? Uh, 800 people will die. For example, if I got infected, nothing would happen with me because I'm a very healthy person. I used to be an athlete and it will be like that uh, with everyone else. So that's the kind of message that we are getting from our own government. And it, it really came to a point where, where the, where especially TV journalism, in my view, of course, I'm a TV journalist, so I'm biased on that. But uh, it came to a point where people would uh, look, look to us, looking for leadership. That's that's my view. Even though Bolsonaro still has a strong, uh, 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 a strong uh, base in society, like around thirty uh, percent, who will follow him. Regardless, regardless, uh, let's everybody kill ourselves. Yes, let's everybody kill ourselves. Uh, but even though he still has a strong social base, uh, I mean, I think that we had a, a crucial role in in trying to convey, you know, the the right kind of information to the to the general population in Brazil. Uh, it, I'm very nihilistic when it comes to journalism and the things that journalism could be uh, capable of doing. But I think that for once. We were necessary, and we tried to do the right thing. And do you think you made a difference? I think I think we did because if everybody every, if everybody followed what the president said, you know, we would we, we would be in an even worse situation right now. It's not that you know we everybody is wearing masks and everybody is staying at home and and reading everything and knowing everything about about COVID nineteen, but I think we um, we did a a decent job, at least we tried, and we tried hard. And I think that uh, that's an absolutely essential point. Kai, I want to go back to something, and I and again, I might bring this up in a roundtable way, but, uh, you know, earlier you mentioned the slogan of the WHO, sh um, which was, uh, you know, facts not fear. Um, and and that, the start of that discussion reminded me of one of my favorite quotes from um, uh, the Once and Future King, the book The Once and Future King, which is uh, by T.H. White, which is shed light, not heat, which I've always thought was, a, you know, a good motto for journalists. Let's shed light, not heat. And the question is, do we sometimes need to shed both, right? Um, but it's very difficult to argue facts over fear when the facts change is my point, right? And so in this particular pandemic, we've seen WHO itself go back and forth on the wearing of masks, go back and forth on airborne infection, right? And similarly, we've seen, you know, different statements from different laboratories. There was, uh, and this was certainly amplified by, um, the government of the United States that wanted to believe this, you know, some early discussion about the fact that this was going to be a seasonal virus. And I believe our president said it would magically melt away in April, which clearly it has not, right? But yet, when you're trying to, um, you know, inform your readership or listenership, right? And they don't fully understand how science works and the process of science and the way things change. How do you best report 
on this ever-changing landscape of information when the facts of yesterday may not yet hold up today in the same way. Well, do you want to address that, Kai? And I'd be curious as to whether the rest of you find that a challenge. Sure. I mean, so I think this has always been a problem in science journalism, right? I mean, to some extent, and working at science, I actually have, a, you know, probably one of the easiest readerships in that respect, because most of them probably, you know, know quite a lot about science. Um, but in general, I think, you know, we've kind of gotten used to this idea that maybe we can cover science a little bit like we cover other areas. So people tend to kind of leave out the caveat sometimes. And I think when science, you know, goes its normal slow way, then it's not so obvious. I mean, we've had discussions about this, of course, right? Like coffee is dangerous one day and then the next day it's healthy and then it's dangerous again. So there's always been this kind of single study syndrome, right? This idea that people write about a single study and it goes one way and then another single study goes another way. And what we really want is kind of the balance of the evidence. Like what does it tell us? Um, in this particular situation, of course, these kind of single study moments are coming, you know, one after another so fast that, you know, it, it's just going to, you know, it's going to be totally obvious to people and really confuse them if you don't, when you're reporting it, always say, so, you know, this is preliminary, this is based on this data, this could change tomorrow. And of course, we shouldn't forget that we're in a moment, pretty much globally, I think, where a lot of populists have kind of used, you know, kind of assailed this idea of a fixed truth anyway. So I think this confusion at the moment, you know, it, it, it's kind of perceived in a in an environment where people are already super skeptical and feel like maybe there is no real truth. And, you know, and, and, and this idea that people say one thing one day and another thing the, another day, that, that's really been used. So if you then take a population that doesn't understand very well how science usually works and how it kind of like, you know, slowly gropingly gets towards a better idea of the truth, then if you don't take a lot of care in, you know, framing that that way, then, then you, you're going to end up alienating people even more. And at some point, the point is not, I think, that people, you know, really believe what Trump says or, or trust Bolsonaro as much as they feel like, you know, everybody else is kind of not sure or lying as well. So I might as well go with the guy who kind of, you know, is the more entertaining one or the more whatever. I, so I, I, think, I think, you know, it's very important to see the context of, of the moment we're in. And I mean, there is a reason that this pandemic, I mean, if you take a country like Brazil, which has done so well in the past in some public health issues, and if you look at how terribly they're doing now, I mean, it's, it's not just a lack of leadership right now in this pandemic. It's, it's a constant undermining of trust and, and, and a constant working against a consistent message. And that kind of reinforces this, this, this kind of you know, nagging feeling that, that populists have been exploiting anyway. And I think that's, that's really where I kind of see, you know, see us heading at the moment. And, and I was very shocked for a long time about how terrible, you know, the U.S. is doing, for instance, given, you know, it's, you know, it's resources also like intellectual, just the fact that 90% of the scientists I talk to are, you know, in the U.S. And, and, and some of the smartest thinkers I know are there. But that's not the point. You know, you're, if you don't have trust, then it's, it's just very hard. Do you want to, it seems to me the ball's in your court there, Alvaro. Alvaro. Do you want to uh, address that kind of issue of, uh, you know, do you have a, a what you think of as a science savvy audience that you're communicating with? Do they trust journalists or do you see the government undermining that trust? And, you know, one example of, it's not, well, maybe it was a single study or a couple of studies, but uh, to bounce back and forth from the U.S. and Brazil for a minute, uh, you know, our president went completely gaga over a drug, hydroxychloroquine, which turned out to be really a bad idea. Uh, and I think you saw some of that in Brazil as well, right? So could you talk a little bit about what kind of, uh, how that comes up and how people accept it and the role of journalists and trying to add rationality to the conversation? And then I'd like to go back to you, Vijay. Me first? Yes. Brazil first? All right. Brazil first. <laughs> uh, for once. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was, 
I think it goes both ways, um, Deborah. I think that we have, uh, I mean, I, as I told you, I work for a, our Sunday evening news magazine, which is an institution of sorts, uh, which has a, v a viewership of like 25 million every uh, Sunday night. So in a country like Brazil, so you can imagine that we are talking to people who are not, the, the, uh, their scientific li literacy is not uh, that high in a country like Brazil, spe especially in, in topics so as dense as this one, as complicated as this one. Uh, the hydroxychloroquine thing, I did a very long piece uh, about hydroxychloroquine in which uh, in which the Lancet article featured prominently. You know, this is definite proof that, proof that hydroxychloroquine uh, doesn't work. I spoke to uh, a number of very uh, important uh, scientists in Brazil who backed uh, the Lancet uh, article. A couple of days later, the Lancet article had a flawed database. What do we do with that? So what I did was another piece, as long as the first one, uh, explaining how an article is put together. I even had a, a professor here of immunology to explain what a scientific, art, a scientific article is. Because there's a thing in Portuguese, maybe in Spanish as well, Susie would know, uh, that uh, the word for journal it's the same word for magazine, revista. So when you mention journal, people may think that the article came out as a story in you know, the magazine with pictures. Oh, of the magazine. So you have to explain all the time that it's a scientific magazine, as we say in, in, in Portuguese. So I did a story, you know, explaining what was wrong with the first hydroxychloroquine article in which I had to explain what a scientific article is. So, and, and the person I interviewed about that, he made a very interesting point. He said, well, science works like that. The difference is that the comings and goings of science are now happening in public. And uh, how that impacts an audience, the audience in Brazil, it's hard to say. But again, uh, we, we, we're trying not to hide our mistakes and we try to be as transparent as possible. But if that undermines the public's confidence in science, it's hard to tell. My guess is no. I mean, the 30% Bolsonaro supporters, regardless, no matter what, they will remain like that for a while. But I think to, to the population in general, uh, well, it is possible to try and, and convey uh, good scientific information. I yeah, I think transparency for science journalism is, is really an excellent. Yeah. And when we sit around and we talk about how do we build trust in the journalistic enterprise, some of it is the transparency of what we do and explaining it. I hadn't thought about that issue with journal magazines, so I'm yeah. really glad you brought that up. Uh -huh. Sinja, uh, would you argue there there was a whole period where there were stories sort of glorifying India, maybe glorifying is the wrong word, you know, but talking about India as the new scientific technology powerhouse in the world um, and leading a lot of people and, you know, to assume that this, in fact, is one of the amazing success stories and scientific literacy and understanding. Um, and, and I'd like to find out if you two see similar challenges in getting scientific information across. I, I'm curious as to, despite the fact that journalists are under attack by the government, if they're in generally trusted by the public with stories like this. And then I'd like to kind of segue from that discussion of hydroxychloroquine to or hydroxychloroquine to uh, drugs in general and access to drugs. And, and you're a good place for me to start with that because India has indeed been a powerhouse in producing generics, right, in, in particular. So trust, right. So, you know, I'm curious about trust, the, the receptiveness of the science literacy audience and, and, and what you're seeing in India regarding uh, access to these kinds of drugs and perceptions of them, I guess. So, uh, Modi came to power in 2014, and this was uh, this uh, attack on the free press, which uh, Trump uh, truly took global with, you know, uh, fake news and uh, constantly repeating these terms, which uh, makes the media the enemy. 
uh, that uh, was, uh, in my opinion, mastered by Modi uh, two years before Trump. And he won the first round of elections, uh, constantly attacking journalists. He has uh, uh, ensured and raided newsrooms, intimidated journalists, uh, sent lawyers after them, um, including the organization that I write for. Um, and the thing is, I, I write for an English paper, and in a country like India, that is a very small upper caste, upper class, privileged audience. And India is not one of those countries where uh, people do not have scientific literacy. The tragedy uh, of this time is that we 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 have uh, all the we have all the skill that is needed to mount an attack on a pandemic in a low resource in a low res resource setting. Uh, we have uh, generic drug makers. We have uh, fantastic doctors who are uh, who have a reputation all over the world. In this case, uh, we just do not have a government which uh, wants any kind of criticism. And especially if you're a journalist who writes in English, uh, especially in my case, I write in English for the Atlantic and the LA Times. So you are not just a traitor. You go to an international audience and complain about uh, about the government. So the government has basically uh, focused on going after any sort of these dissent as against uh, uh, prioritizing public health at this point. Uh, in fact, our, our health minister has not held a single briefing since the pandemic began. And this is wow. something even someone like Donald Trump understands. Uh, our, uh, our prime minister has not addressed a briefing in six years. So we are we are uh, facing a pandemic um, at a time that we are in complete regulatory capture. Um, uh, the author Arundhati Roy last month said that there is a genocidal atmosphere in India, and I completely agree with her that uh, this government has weaponized the pandemic, invoked colonial era uh, laws like the Epidemics Act, which was first brought in power during the bubonic plague when the British Empire wanted to uh, curtail civil rights in Mumbai. And this government is doing exactly the same thing that the British Empire did the last time around there was a pandemic. Now, uh, coming back, coming to your second question about uh, India being a powerhouse uh, for generic drug industry. And I'm, I'm really glad one of the silver linings of this pandemic is that for, for once we are having a global drug pricing conversation, which includes the point of view of the developing world. Because uh, the truth is, no matter what is developed, no matter what is discovered in whichever part of the world, it will be scaled up either in India or China, where the factories are. And uh, if we do not pay attention to the kind of uh, uh, completely racist uh, trade policies and in intellectual property policies, uh, the TRIPS agreement in particular, uh, that is ensuring that we do not have access to drugs. If I take the uh, example of hydroxychloroquine, when the US government wanted to bulk procure it, the first thing Donald Trump did in a press conference was threatened India with retaliation and then bulk procured the whole thing. Then Remdesivir came along. He bulk procured the global supply. So yeah. there are two aspects here where even when we do have a drug, are we going to have broad and equitable distribution in poorer countries? And the second aspect is, even in rich countries, the tragedy is the American patients don't have access to remdesivir just the same way as Indian patients don't. Because uh, for as long as now, we have over and over again for cancer and then for TB and then for hep C, uh, kept doing stories uh, in silos which says, oh, uh, the American patients are suffering because of the insurance system. And then uh, we do a story about how black and brown patients are dying uh, disproportionately. But we do not talk about the tiered pricing strategy, which uh, all big pharma companies now apply. Basically, they develop a drug, which is invariably procured out of a university-funded research. And then they come to India or China and sign a voluntary license 
and then ensure that it is not exported to either commercially viable markets or wealthy countries like the us or high burden markets which are poorer countries like uh, brazil and india so nobody has access to these drugs then because patients uh, keep dividing themselves into cancer patients who are fighting for access or hiv patients who are fighting for access we don't have one a uh, united conversation about how whatever this injustice in health is in my opinion flows from how the trips policies are and we have to go back and renegotiate it one of the good ideas that i've heard now has come from msf where they say that um they said this uh, earlier for remdesivir and thankfully it's it's not showing uh, as much promise as gilead would have put uh and i'm hoping another drug will come along but what we do need is a globally binding treaty which who has the power uh, to put together and uh, it has to ensure equitable uh, distribution because sooner than later it's already happening in the us where african americans uh, are uh, have a higher mortality so at yeah. some point the pandemic is going to take hold in the global south and black and brown patients are going to die disproportionately and unless we have a conversation and look at what are the deals that are being signed between big pharma is in india because this is the first time we have a pandemic where the interests are aligned uh we will we will not be able to solve this problem of uh, global drug pricing I agree with you and and it reminds me of a couple of points that you know I've thought as a long time science journalist one is that uh you know and it's certainly reinforced by organizations like the World Federation of Science Journalists is that we have to really look at these stories globally right including the pharmaceutical pipeline and and quit acting as if and certainly in this pandemic i can get swallowed up by what's going on in the us alone and, and remember that these are global stories and they're connected stories and the other is if i could go back and redo science journalism school i would put more policy in there right i think it's really important for us as science journalists to remember that you know even bench science doesn't exist in some you know golden vacuum separate from reality and a lot of the things we're writing about have powerful policy implications behind them and good science journalists need to be aware of that personal opinion um i wanted to also talk about i mean it sounds to me your point about the global south you know that we're seeing um it, we are if you look at the trackers you were definitely seeing increased cases in latin america not just brazil uh and certainly cases have been accelerating in um uh, speaking of us borders mexico um is there something kai in in what we've been talking about in europe that uh, explains why barring you know the interesting experiment in sweden uh the approach seems so much more science based and logical is is that more culture than anything or is that some amazing consequence of good journalism <laughs> oh i wish um yeah no i'd love to take credit for it for how your office done <laughs> um, no i th i think it's very um you know it, it goes back to what i was saying earlier i think we have um you know there is a little bit more just structurally there's lots of historic reasons for it there i think there is more trust in europe uh, towards the government i mean you have to remember when you don't have a vaccine when you don't have any drugs really all you have is people changing their behavior and in order for them to change their behavior you need to have a consistent message and people need to trust you that your message is the right one and that you're doing giving it in good faith um and i think there is you know kind of a, a, a store of trust towards the government in many places in Europe that that has been eroded in in the US and in other places um and the message has been consistent i would argue that the two exceptions um to this in europe would really be the uk which didn't have consistent messaging um and i think they did very very badly because of it and then sweden had consistent messaging but they arguably had the wrong message um i would say so um yeah so so i think that, you know there's no magic ingredient i mean I, i'm honestly still frustrated at the fact that we 
you know, I mean, we saw what happened in Wuhan. Um, this goes back to what you were saying about this, you know, about this being a global story. I mean, we saw what was happening in Wuhan. And yet, you know, it didn't arrive in Europe. Like, it, you know, people didn't take it seriously until we had Bergamo in Italy, like worse scenes. And even when that happened, the US felt like this is not going to happen here until New York happened. And now you can see Houston going the same way as New York because even Texas can't learn from New York, apparently. Like, I am so frustrated by the fact that, that you know, we, we seem incapable of learning. I mean, it's, it's a sign that systemically something is very broken in how this world responds. And, and of course, it's our job a little bit as journalists. I mean, you also have you know, historians who we, we can learn from history, right? But I mean, at this point in this, in, in this pandemic, we, we, we should have learned enough from other places to know what we need to do and how we need to do it. And I find it immensely frustrating. And there's this idea of a global health journalist. And I kind of feel like any health journalist, in a sense, this, if this pandemic hasn't shown that, then it hasn't shown anything, that, that any health journalist needs to be a global health journalist. I mean, we're, you know, we are fundamentally in this together. And, and, and the fact that we're not dealing with it in, in, in that sensible way really, really frustrates me. And I, I do think that even in Europe, we're doing well at the moment. Um, there are signs, I mean, we're pushing it, right? I mean, we're traveling now for holidays, like borders have opened up. There's, there's bound to be at some point, you know, some increases and then it really comes down to, you know, are people able to basically do the same thing again that we did last time? Um, and, and I'm very curious, like I, I am not totally confident that it's gonna be that easy. Um, people seem to have a very, very short memory and I just, you know, given given also like that, you know, with German history and many other places like, like that, we always think that we've learned something, you know, from stuff that happened 70, 80 years ago. It's kind of astonishing that we don't seem to learn from stuff that happened seven or eight weeks ago. Yes, that's a good point. You know, it's interesting because, um, you, I mean, your comparison of New York and Houston highlights, I think, one of the challenges in the United States, which is, the United States really, you know, pretends to be one country, but is effectively many, right? And if you go into the different regions of the country, like the Northeast where I live, I live in Boston, um, or Texas where Houston is, uh, I have a sister there, or uh, the deep, deep South, right? Alabama, Georgia, Florida being another hot spot. Um, you, you find that in many ways, people who live in those parts of the country do not feel connected to each other. And so one of the things you saw in the US was a, a, a kind of, sh to use a German word and mispronounce it, schadenfreude uh, thing from the South. Oh, look at the Northeast, right? The sucky Northeast where all the liberals live and they're getting hammered. and here in the wonderful Sun Belt, I, I mean, you have people saying, you know, we're Florida, New York screwed it up. We obviously transcended it. Um, and so some of those kinds of uh, tensions and, it, that you see in any really large country, I think, probably played out, a uh, large populated country. And, and I would guess, although uh, I'm not an expert on it, that you would probably see some of this in India and Brazil as well, or in that there would be different regions or urban versus rural areas in which the information is handled differently. Is that correct? For Brazil, it is. We are many countries within a country, as right. we usually say. And who would have thought that one of the hotspots would be Manaus, the capital of the state of Amazonas, and stuck in the middle of the Amazon, was one of the hotspots of the pandemic. Who would have thought of that? And it has to do with the fact that they have a free trade zone there that has lots of dealings with China and also with the rest of Brazil, with Sao Paulo. So we're not sure yet if it came from China or Sao Paulo, but who, who, who would have thought that? And there are, and now uh, the, the states in the, in the deep south of Brazil and in the uh, center, west, center midwest, the Brazilian midwest, that's a rough translation, deep yeah. south of Brazil and the... Brazilian Midwest, who are doing really well, there are more uh, agriculture, agribusiness plays a large role there. So maybe that's it. But now they're becoming hotspots as well. And for and and finally, São Paulo seems to be getting to a plateau of sorts. So uh, it's a country within a country. It's it's huge. 
and w with a lot of inequality, much more than in the U.S. or maybe comparable to 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 India. Certainly not Germany. So 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 yes, uh, I mean there are different levels of where the pandemic is at right now, and different levels of understanding of will this ever get to us? Yes, that's a major thing here. Same in India, Vicha. Yeah, uh, India is uh, uh, an extremely unequal country right now when the pandemic finds us. Uh, on top of it, we have this fascist government when in Kashmir has been under lockdown since August 2015. And the fact that uh, Kashmiris have to currently deal with the pandemic without internet is, is uh, it's a human rights violation. Uh, the, the, in airline South India, we have a left left government, which is the only state in the country which has done well, because it has a strong public health system. And uh, if anything, that would be proof that we are not going to get out of this if we do not uh, look. If if we keep looking at uh, uh, COVID as the only disease that exists, because uh, India's crumbling health system has completely collapsed under the pandemic. And uh, yes. that, that means that TB services, HIV services, women can't go in to deliver babies. And if we do not look at it and come out of it with solutions that look at universal health coverage and uh, taxpayer-funded, uh, 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 at least for our nationalized health services, if we don't start having these conversation, I worry that uh, the pandemic will have a very long, protracted, and frankly devastating stay in India, which uh, for me at this point worries me the most uh, in the, uh, for Kashmiri Indians, for all sorts of minorities who at this point are already um, hanging by a thread with this government. Uh, so the pandemic has basically brought uh, all the social, the, the social fabric which was uh, being torn apart over the last six years. Uh, all these fissures are now uh, in front of us. It's fractured. And if we don't start talking about this and start having the right conversation, I frankly don't see, um, I, I don't see a, a solution uh, at this point. Which kind of then, uh, to, to which in, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense that the government has gone with the simplest reaction, which is just plain and simple denialism. So they're like, we hide the data and we'll say it's not happening. Because if you start acknowledging the problem is so big, why do you start to, uh, to, uh, to solve it? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I see sometimes when I'm listening to you, I see so many parallels to here in terms of the denialism of our presidency and uh, and also the demonization of journalists, which I expect also kind of plays into some of the way you were able to message in Europe, uh, you know, recently at some of the Republican, our president is a Republican, uh, meetings, they've been selling T-shirts about lynching journalists, right? Mm -hmm. They have uh, illustrations on them, they go, rope, tree, journalist, right? Uh, and the first time I saw that, I, I've been a journalist, a, a journalist since I was 18. I was like, oh, that's my whole life. Right, I've been doing this, and here you are, proudly wearing a T-shirt, wishing that I was dead. I, I think that that again tends to follow in the shadow of, you know, uh, Donald Trump wishes he had the power of Bodhi, frankly, uh, an authoritarian regime in which you need to demonize the messenger, right? Um, but but you said something else, uh, Vidna, not in a, an incredibly positive way which was you worried about what was to come. I, I mean, there's been quite a bit of coverage on and off about the fact that, you know, kids aren't getting vaccinated. Um, medicines aren't being given, right? In the U.S., we're seeing an increase in opioid overdoses because those programs all shut down in the pandemic. Um, and so the long-term other health consequences associated this were real. Uh, are already to sort of show around the edges of this pandemic. I would like to ask you, not that I think anyone ever has an effective crystal ball, 
but you know, you're three journalists who have been in the trenches of this pandemic from the beginning. So I'd, I'd like to ask you two questions, which is, did any of you have a sense it was going to take the shape that it actually did? And do you have any forecasts as to what you think are likely to come next? I know we're, and, and I would throw into that very open mix the question of vaccines, which still seem to me to be in the uh, not yet, not entirely probable stage. But I'd be curious both as to your assessment of how well you did in assessing this, uh, this the, the sort of forward motion or trajectory of this pandemic. Is there something you would have done differently uh, aside from ringing alarm bells? I mean, um, and uh, what do you what do you think is most likely to be the kind of stories that you're going to be working on going forward? Would one do one of you want me to like to start that ball, or shall I just pick a victim? I, I think we should start in Europe. No, in Brazil. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm fine. I can do that. Uh, I think we. Uh, I. I personally uh, uh, had no idea it would be th it become this big, uh, and I've been covering it since the beginning. Since the first case appeared in first cases appeared in Wuhan, and um, we had the examples of SARS and H1N1, and. Um, what makes me feel a little less bad about this is that I interviewed recently uh, Peter Doherty, who won a Nobel Prize, in, a prominent immunologist from Australia, and he told me he had no idea it would become this big. He would th he thought it would be a, a, a severe flu that would affect only uh, people, certain certain uh, groups of people in terms of age and comor comorbidities. So I think uh, the very first stories that I did when the thing was uh, in, happening in China should have raised, uh, should have rang more bells, as you said. Uh, that's one thing I would have done differently, but I think I had no idea, uh, neither myself or I think most of scientists had no idea it would become this big. What I look forward to doing from now on uh, would be stories about herd immunity, maybe, <laughs> that finally we've reached the plateau and what comes next. But we surely have to do stories about what may come next, what may come next, what sort of yeah. pandemics are, we will be facing in the near future. I think that's it. That's an excellent point, Kai. You know, I, I, I've been asked this a lot, actually, in the beginning, because I, I think I wrote an article in maybe 2013, um, which was actually about the fact that there you know, that there are bats in China carrying, you know, SARS-like coronaviruses and that they could cause the next pandemic. So, so the idea that this could happen has been, you know, on my mind, you know, for many years. Um, the specific shape that it ended up taking, of course, was, was very different from what I imagined. And I think it has a lot to do with the way that we as humans uh, reacted to it. Like I, like, I still am baffled, like even looking at it in reality, I am still baffled at, you know, the flood of videos on Twitter of mostly women actually in, in the US kind of like, you know, going to shops and for hospitals and filming themselves getting all upset that they are supposed to wear a mask. It's just to me um, that, that part, I, I really underestimated that. Um, I thought when things get bad enough, everybody takes notice. That's something that I took from my time in Liberia as well. At some point, people change their behavior and an epidemic kind of comes to a natural end in, in some way because of that. That is That seems to be taking a very, very long time. Um, and, and people really seem to be ready to, you know, accept harm to themselves just for avoiding the inconvenience of wearing a mask, for instance. That, that, that just, like, it still doesn't compute for me. Um, you know, my training isn't in psychology and may, may, maybe that's something I need to, I need to brush up on. Um, it just surprised me. And, um, and that's maybe the, the biggest oversight I had, I think, was, was really anticipating a little bit more what the current political climate um, would mean for a pandemic. And there were people who said it before. There were very, you know, smart people in like, you know, like dealing with like large scale events and catastrophes and saying, you know, the moment that, for instance, Trump has, you know, something like this happen, um, they, they predicted quite a few of the things that happened. Um, for the future, I think 
you know, we're, 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 it feels like at least in Europe, we're in a bit of a lull where we can start looking back a little bit um, and kind of look at some of what did or didn't go well. Um, and, and I think we just need to, you know, try and really use the time to learn, to see what we've learned in that time and really do that and, and write some of those stories. And then, of course, there's plenty of science, you know, to, to keep us busy um, for the next months um, and probably years. Agreed. And so we are out of time. You guys have been amazing. I think Vidya had to go. Uh, but we'll see her again when we do the actual live podcast uh, uh, event. And and just uh, then we can also, I will also ask you, which I didn't have time to ask you this time because it's been such a good conversation, uh, some of the advice you might give to journalists also trying to figure out how to navigate this. But thank you so much for your wisdom and insight and, and your time today. So here we are back again, and uh, I want to ask Helen Browns Brownswell. Helen is uh, the infectious disease reporter at STAT. Uh, she has the distinction of not being from the United States, but living here, so that she brings a you know a, a Canadian and international perspective as well uh, as a perspective from being based in Boston. Uh, Helen, that recording was made about a week ago, and I ran the numbers, had gone up considerably, no surprise, uh, since we uh, did that recording. So I want to briefly mention the ones I tracked today, about 15 million cases worldwide, over 600,000 deaths worldwide. U.S. is approaching 4 million cases and well over 140,000 deaths. Brazil, over 2 million cases, 80,000 deaths. India, over 1 million cases, uh, almost approaching 30,000 deaths. Uh, Europe overall, about 2.8 million cases, about 200,000 deaths. Clearly, uh, all of us underestimated this virus in different ways. And I'd like to go back to um, a couple of points that were raised. One was Kai, should journalists have raised alarm bells earlier and would they have been effective? And then another one that kind of floats through this, which has to do with accuracy of information. Are we seeing from the respective governments of these countries, as you assess it, the case counts I'm giving you, do you believe them? Do they underestimate? overestimate? Where's your sense of where we are in this right now as an infectious disease journalist? You want me to ask, answer both those questions? I or? want you to throw a lot okay. at you, and especially because okay. we weren't able right. uh, to bring you in last week. I'd like to you know, have you right. deal with those first, and then we'll open it up more widely. Yeah, I wish I had been able to be here last week. It was a really interesting uh, discussion, and I effectively agree with pretty much everything everybody said. Um, uh, you know, uh, Kai and I have talked uh, a number of times, I think, about the issue of, uh, you know, the early days and would things have changed. I, I don't know if they would have. I certainly took it very seriously right from the first minute I saw that there were cases because um, I had covered uh, the SARS outbreak of, in 2003 and there were just you know, echoes of that in the earliest reports. And so I was sort of programmed to, to see that this was something that could potentially go badly. Um, I know I wished I had been more alarmist, honestly, you know, uh, at, at times. I, on February 1st, I interviewed Mike Ryan, who runs the emergencies program at the WHO. And, you know, <laughs> he, 
he he said this is still controllable. I thought he was nuts <laughs> because it's a it's a pathogen that spreads, you know, by you know it's a respiratory pathogen. How do you control a re respiratory pathogen? But I mean, he's Mike Ryan. He knows a lot more than I do. So I wrote the story, and um, I I pretty much wish now I'd put my hair on fire trying to you know get people to t pay attention to what he was saying because. You know, it turns out that one can control respiratory pathogens, or at least this one, that there are ways to bend a curve and to do things that, frankly, people didn't think were possible before this. And um, and lots of countries have done, and yet, you know, the United States has not, Brazil has not, other places have not. And, you know, I, I, I felt here, like, from the get-go, there was either a maybe it won't come, or there's nothing we can do to stop it kind of approach. I, th I think there was a fatalism from very early on. And, uh, you know, going back, it's like, if you could go back and, and inject, you know, change time, I think, you know, addressing that fatalism probably might have had a different outcome. But of course, that's not doable. Um, your second question was about accuracy of information? Yes, from governments in particular. Um, well, it's an interesting question sitting here in the United States. Um, you know, I'm going to riff on that a little bit. You know, the, the point you asked the others, and, and Kai w was addressing this in the conversation you had last week. You know, we do a terrible job, both our schools and perhaps us as science journalists, preparing people for the fact that when there is a new disease, virtually nothing is known about it, and we will learn over time. And what we think we know in week one will not be what we know in week five, will not be what we know in week 25. And, you know, some things will remain true and some things will shake out and we'll learn more as time goes on. And that is not a reflection of anybody trying to mislead or, um, or, you know, act in any kind of a nefarious fashion. It's just the way science is, it evolves. And so, you know, you because people are not prepared for that kind of stuff, you see a lot of reaction to things like the CDC changing course on wearing cloth face coverings. There was zero evidence to support wearing cloth face coverings. And then people started putting together that, you know, it seemed to be doing something elsewhere. Maybe it should be studied. Uh, they made a recommendation. Later, the WHO made a recommendation, and they're both being, you know, lambasted for having changed their position and having acted too slow. But they were trying to do evidence-based, you know, communi risk communications. Um, information will change, and we we need to understand that and forgive the fact that people didn't know all the facts beforehand but to your point that doesn't forgive people who are making erroneous statements and we have seen plenty of those in this pandemic and history will judge the utterers of those statements quite harshly i think i hope people, so people are dying as a consequence and there is a, a question here from zoom that uh kind of follows up what what you just said Helen, and it is to both uh, uh, Alvaro and Vidya, how do you manage to get information then and, and tell an accurate story when governments like India and Brazil, this question mentions Mexico as well, minimize the pandemic because uh, they believe it makes them look bad. How do you overcome the uh, uh, untrustworthy information from your own government to give people an accurate picture? Vidya, you want to start then, Alvaro? Uh, sure. Um, well, I've not been able to. Uh, the the uh, implicit in the question is that I have somehow managed navigated this well, and I don't think I have. Uh, it, it, getting information, uh, the Indian government, like you said, we've crossed the million cases, and the Indian government still doesn't accept having community transmission. And uh, because of this, this is information that should be in public domain, but it's been like pulling teeth. 
uh, getting any information out from this government has been just so frustrating and uh, there are some good people in the system and you have to uh, believe that there are good doctors in the system and there are people who know what's happening and uh, uh, like helen said history is going to judge them uh, the way they deserve but at this point i don't even feel that i'm even able to make that first draft of how bad things are uh, because uh, I, I, i don't feel I, i've been able to just capture this moment in history in india uh, the way with the horrors of what's happening to the minorities to to people who don't have food and don't have shelter and now have a pandemic to deal with so that's a very accurate point and let me uh, bring it over to you alvaro and say do we then expect too much of journalists that they accurately describe a pandemic when the the sources they should be relying it are busy trying to uh, misstate the evidence uh, Deborah, as i said in the previous part i mean it, we had to we had to step in and, and do the job and in the case of brazil there's something very tragically funny happened here the government every every uh, day early in the evening they would put out a statement with a number of new cases and and that's i'd say maybe sometime around 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. so our prime time newscast which starts at 8:30 p.m. would always have those numbers one day the president said i don't want stories on it's called jornal nacional our prime time newscast newscast i don't want stories on jornal nacional anymore these numbers will be released much late in the evening like at 10 p.m. So there would there, we wouldn't have the official numbers at the right time. So the solution for that was to put together a media consortium of uh, Global, the network that I work for, and other uh, prominent media companies in the country that tally up their own numbers based on information that we get from the states, from each state, which which each state uh, which is uh, the information is is reliable. And actually, the information that comes from the government. It's not blatantly wrong. That's not it. But it's slower. Uh, the the timing is not appropriate. So we came up. Not we. I mean, uh, the Brazilian media came up with that. We tally up our own numbers, which are more reliable than the government's uh, numbers. That's that's how that's how things are going. Uh, I think that's right very now. smart. I have a question here. Uh, there also all of these questions are related, but. Uh, Kai, you talk about feeling more comfortable talking about your fears on Twitter than in your articles. Uh, do you think the reluctance of science journalists may be detrimental to talk to share fears to their stories? Are there better ways to contextualize those fears in your stories than we have been able to accomplish so far? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are better ways. <laughs> uh, the question is, do I know any of them? Um, not yet otherwise I, i hope i would use them or at least try to um i think what is clear to me is that i mean this is part of the bigger discussion in in journalism right it's this question of what is the position from which i write i mean you know i mean jay rosen has said there's no view from nowhere i mean there's this just and i think there's more of an acceptance nowadays that as a journalist you have a certain point of view um and you know you're a human being you have you know a certain reaction to things and that's part of i think you know there is a way of putting that into your story and and making that um making that part of what makes you trustworthy in a way and i personally I, i don't remember whether i talked to helen about this but helen wrote a story very recently oh no i did it on twitter <laughs> actually <laughs> i you know helen wrote a story recently which she started saying something like you know there's no use denying it uh the covid-19 pandemic in the us is a is a raging dumpster fire I mean that's yes. the kind of story you know I I'm not quite sure I would be able to to write a lead like that at Science Magazine but you know coming from someone like Helen I think that that packs a certain punch and I think we have to be willing you know this is a you know this this is a very specific situation this is you know maybe a once hopefully I I want to say once in a lifetime but I doubt it's once in a lifetime um but you know it's hopefully a once in a decade um situation we're finding ourselves in um so I think we have to be able also a little bit to to step up our game and to maybe you know respond in a way that that's commensurate with with the situation we find ourselves in um you know i'm all for you know 
keeping calm and you know letting the facts speak and all of that but but i think there is space within this you know within journalism for different voices and i think it is important um you know to be able to to maybe you know have those kind of voices you know out there as well and, and that's something i'm certainly going to be taking away from this pandemic going forward thinking about you know what is my role in this and how do i maybe you know how does my twitter persona you know inform my my journalism i think yeah that's a good point and i think uh that you know speaking as someone who lives in the united states dumpster fire is is an absolute accurate term which is why she could get away with it uh but but you also have to be in a position where you're considered a trustworthy source which is often a challenge for journalists do people trust us do they do they believe what we say do they see the integrity behind behind the reporting that we're doing and this leads me to a question to all the panelists uh which is uh, what would you say has been the most challenging factor of covering this pandemic uh the <coughs> excuse me the questioner lists three uh four possibilities governments managing it, conspiracy theories, fake news uh, in social media, that's kind of stuff, contradictory information, and, and D, other. So if you were going to pick, all of you, the, the, the real challenge that you think you faced in doing justice to covering this pandemic, what would be at the top of your list? I'll go first, if you don't mind. Okay. I, you know, I have a close second, but I would pick D, other. <laughs> and it's just the sheer scale of the story. It is so massive. It is impossible to keep on top of it. I, the way I report, I like to go deeply into topics and know what I'm writing about really well. Uh, it's almost impossible to do now. You cannot keep up with all the preprints with you know, whether the preprint actually made it into a journal, uh, what all the journals are pushing out, because they're all pushing out things, you know, there've been five or six things that have come out probably while we've been talking. Um, the numbers, uh, whether the numbers are accurate, uh, it, it's just, you know, people use the expression fire hose. It, it doesn't begin to describe this. It's like being hit by a tsunami multiple times a day you're just standing there and it washes over you and you you know you're flailing around trying to figure out okay do i change what i'm working on and do instead i drop this and do that it's it's very tough and it's also really hard to keep abreast of everything i'm, I'm finding it very very challenging that's an excellent point. Uh, we have a few minutes left, and so I'd like to ask each of you then to address that question uh, you know, quickly. Uh, Alvara, what, what have you found the greatest challenge? And uh, if you can compress it into your minute or so, uh, what kind of advice would you have as we go forward? Uh, we, uh, I think for us in Brazil, it's fake news and things that people uh, get from social media, WhatsApp, and how do you address those things and how do you make clear that that is fake, that that is not true, that your story will not be misunderstood, that you are somehow promoting something that is mm. fake. I think that's the biggest challenge for us. So that's why we try to be as clear as possible. And, 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 and as uh, the, the reporting has to be as detailed as possible so people understand what's fake, what's real. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Vidya. Um, I, I want to say all of the above, uh, but if I have to uh, pick one thing that I'm personally struggling with is to somehow, uh, in India it's also coupled with a humanitarian tragedy with the, with the lockdown and the migrant crisis, and it's just become impossible to get people to care about it. There's just mm -hmm. such an, uh, in fact it's just difficult to even it's ex just to hear Helen explain that tsunami of cases was was physically tiring for me because that's the kind of deadlines uh, we've been uh, meeting for like six months now, and there's no end in sight, and uh, it gets overwhelming. Nothing in my training uh, as a as a journalist has has equipped me to deal with a story like this. So. Yes, that's awesome. All of you guys just are so smart on these points. It's a pleasure to moderate this panel. Kai. I, I'm 
you know, largely have to agree with Helen. I think for me, you know, just I, I'll try and be constructive on this. So, so it is impossible to keep up with everything. Um, you know, and in the in the early months, I would you know, sleep very little, talk to you know ten different scientists every day, try to read the papers, know what's coming up. It's completely impossible at this point, and it became impossible a long time ago. Um, so, so for me, kind of the you know, I'm very lucky. I have amazing colleagues at Science Magazine, like John Cohn, like Martin Ensring, like Gretchen Fogel, Jennifer Cousin Frankel. So, you know, we 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 have the luxury of kind of dividing it up a little bit. And of course, journalism is always teamwork. And so, but even you know, so so I'm kind of concentrating on a few things. I'm you know concentrating on kind of the the, the genetics of it and and the treatment, uh, the therapies. Um, and even then, it's really hard. So what I've ended up doing is like every two weeks or three weeks, like I, I, you know, I do something on treatments and then I switch over to genetics and then I try to read everything that happened in the last two weeks on genetics and that's a lot. Um, you know, and then I write a story kind of looking, you know, trying to define the current moment and look a little bit forward. And then I switch back to the other one. That for me at the moment, at least, that's still kind of working. You, I think you have to, and this is going to sound very unjournalistic, but I do think you have to you know, free yourself a little bit from, you know, every, you know, being on top of every piece of breaking news, because, you know, you, I think you're doing the, you know, the, the public a much bigger favor if you're really trying to, you know, to look back at the landscape of the last two weeks and to identify the peaks in that landscape, and then try to describe those peaks and, and kind of, you know, put them into context. And, and if you do that, it also means that in the next two weeks, not every little piece of breaking news is going to completely change what you wrote. Um, like, you know, if you wrote about hydroxychloroquine, the, the big study, the recovery trial, um, it, it'll be very hard for a different trial to kind of like, you know, invalidate those results or change my view fundamentally on hydroxychloroquine because, because of the way that that trial was conducted and the numbers and so on. So for the moment, I'm kind of finding my, you know, my, my way of working that way works. And then the other thing is, I think, like, honestly, and this goes, you know, for all of us, I think we all need to have a break. I think we all do need to take all of this. Like, you know, there's this, um, there, there's this sense sometimes when you're completely caught up in a story that, you know, you, you can't be replaced, which is complete nonsense. Um, you know, all of us can be, and I think we really have to have to take that time. Like I'm realizing, you know, I'm young and I, I always thought that, you know, I wouldn't hit a wall easily. And I'm noticing that, that there are just things that, that you can't keep on doing. For, for six months and certainly not for a year. Yeah. And I wish we could do this for another hour. This is such a good conversation. Maybe next summer we, we'll come back <laughs> and we'll really assess what happened. But you all are an amazing group of panelists. I, we, I feel as a science journalist so lucky to have all of you and your colleagues. So, you know, letting us know what's going on and, and dealing with the tsunami and still reporting and making sure that uh, everyone out there, including me a, a, as a reader and listener, has some kind of clue as to how this pandemic is changing the world. So thank all of you for your time here and for what you do every day. Thank you for having us over. Great. I want to echo Deborah and just thank you all for being here with us today. I know I learned a lot from hearing you talk and judging by the participants' questions, it seemed that they learned a lot as well. Um, it was really helpful to get that behind the scenes look at your responsible reporting of the pandemic and learn more about how the pandemic is playing out in your respective countries. So thank you all so, so much for being with us here today. Um, before we wrap up, I just want to invite everyone to come to our last panel of the day, which will be at 4 p.m. Central, and we'll be looking at disinformation and misinformation and what can be done beyond traditional fact checking. So this conversation will be especially relevant and timely. Uh, you can look at isoj.org to find out more details about it, and we look forward to seeing you there as ISOJ 2020 continues. Thank you. Nice to meet you guys.